Hello everyone. In this presentation, we're going to be talking about the different types of contamination that you'll find when we're using gas tungsten arc welding. Now, when we start looking at what is acceptable before what is unacceptable, we need to first understand what is acceptable. So when we look at things like our ceramic cups, they need to be clean. Now, after some wear and tear, you know, use by various students, multiple semesters and years, the outside of the ceramic cups are going to get dirty. They're going to pick up, you know, dust, dirt, uh, other things that come from welding. But it's not the outside so much that we're concerned about. It's what's on the inside of our ceramic cups. They need to be clean or as clean as possible. Now our ceramic cups should also show little to no signs of breaking. Now if there's a little chip on the outside, that's not really going to affect our weld. But when the chip occurs uh, where the tungsten exits the ceramic cup, so out through the front, once it starts getting cracked and chipped, around that uh, face then maybe we need to take a look at is it going to disrupt the flow of shielding gas or anything like that um, we also need to check the color of things that are building up uh, inside of our ceramic cup so like i said earlier our ceramic cups are going to get dirty with use if it's well dust or just any kind of dust from the work environment, think, you know, something that can be removed very easily, go ahead and remove it. But if it ends up being something else, uh, we'll take a look at some examples here shortly, then our cleaning methods may have to change up a bit. So when we start talking about, or as we continue to talk about what's acceptable, let's start with uh, a gas lens setup. So if we start with the ceramic cup, this is a brand new ceramic cup right out of the packaging. You see that along the face, there are no chips, no cracks, which is, which is good. And then we take a look at the inside of our ceramic cup and we can visibly see that pink color. This is what we want to, uh, this is what we ideally want to see. Now, again, if it gets a little dirty, you see a couple cracks on the outside, maybe it's chipped in some random locations, it's fine. But if it becomes cracked or chipped along this surface right here, uh, we need to keep an eye on it because if it gets to be you know, something more than a small chip or a small crack, that can lead to a disruption in the flow of shielding gas, which leads to some problems later on down the line. Now, if we take a look at the actual gas lens, now along the threads, we see a little bit of buildup. This could be just from improper storage. Uh, this stuff, it can be removed by maybe using a wire brush, maybe a gentle cloth, nothing that's going to uh, ruin the threads, but something that will just be able to remove what's getting caked on those threads. And we, if we take a look at the wire mesh screen or just simply the mesh screen, it needs to be free of any kind of debris, contaminants, any kind of uh, spatter, anything like that. So when you're inspecting your TIG kits, you need to go through, examine your, your parts to make sure that you can even use them, okay? Now, if we take a look at the collet body and the ceramic cups that we use with those, your collet bodies, again, with wear and tear and time of use, they're not going to be as shiny. But if you see any kind of buildup, whether it's dust, dirt, things that are easy to remove, please remove that. Otherwise, it could lead to some issues while you're welding. And if you notice that your collet bodies, they are melted, if they, they show signs of any kind of arcing, if the threads 
are ruined in any way, you need to replace those with a newer one uh, before you start welding. And then the same for ceramic cups. Again, inspect the inside, make sure that it's clean, free of any debris or uh, buildup. And then the same thing along this surface right here along the face, make sure that there are no significant cracks or chips. And now let's start taking a look at what are some signs of contamination or some signs that we need to do a bit of cleaning. So if we start taking a look at this ceramic cup, I've got two different images of it from two different angles. We see that along the face right here, there is some metallic buildup. Now this can happen with wear and tear, just you know, prolonged use. It can also be caused by using some improper welding techniques that would cause any sort of uh, sparking or spatter being thrown back and landing on the ceramic cup. And then we see a little bit of residue and contaminants starting to build up along the inner surface of our ceramic cup. So when your ceramic cups get to this point, they are salvageable. They can still be used, but you need to clean them. So you can clean them in a variety of different ways. You can try to maybe get one of your smaller fingers in there with a cloth, clean it out, make sure it's a clean cloth. Make sure uh, to use maybe like a brush, whether you're using like something that's nylon, that's not gonna scar the surface of it, or maybe uh, a pipe cleaner but I would try to avoid anything that's going to permanently scratch or damage the ceramic cup but if you need to get in there with a pipe cleaner that maybe say has some hard bristles maybe some some metal bristles you know just be easy about it just to remove what's building up and then go over it with a cloth to remove any kind of residue that the brush may have left behind Now here are some examples of ceramic cups that are just way past the salvaging point. This, you'll see examples of this when students are continually trying to weld with contaminated tungsten electrodes. Maybe they're trying to weld with no shielding gas. Maybe they're welding with the wrong polarity or any combination of things. So we can just take a look at these three different ceramic cups and you can see that the contamination appears in very similar ways it looks like these ceramic cups have just gathered a, a large amount of spatter or particulate matter that's kind of bounced from the weld or the welding arc or the tungsten and it just collects on the inside and that front outer surface now you can attempt to clean this with a cloth or say like a wire brush but honestly in my experience what i found is either that stuff is permanently attached or you can use something like pliers needle nose pliers maybe even your whelpers to get in there and scrub that stuff off but when you're using a hard object like that you're really risking damaging the ceramic cup so at this point, if any of my students have something that looks like this, I tell them just to replace it, get a new one. And now let's take a look at a couple of examples of some gas lenses when they're also at the unacceptable level, you just can't use them anymore. Now in this situation right here, this image on the left, a student thought that they could weld without the ceramic cup. After going over what a gas lens was in class and the advantages of having a gas lens, they thought that they could go without using that ceramic cup because the gas lens is better at focusing the stream of shielding gas. And so this is the result of that. There is a lot of damage on these threads 
there's a lot of damage to the mesh. And of course, you can see that their tungsten became contaminated. Now, if we take a look at the gas lens on the right, this gives us another good look at this mesh screen. And we see that it's just caked in contaminants, caked in what seems to be spatter. Now, in both cases, this buildup on the mesh screens will disrupt the flow of shielding gas. So you're essentially going to be welding with little to no shielding gas, which is going to result in an irregular welding arc and an eventual contamination of your tungsten electrode. What's also going to happen is that as you're welding, you probably won't be able to see it with the naked eye, but little bits and pieces, little particles of this buildup are going to eventually uh, dis dislodge themselves from the buildup and they are going to enter the welding arc and it's going to either one cause an irregular welding arc you know, it's going to contaminate your electrode or it's going to contaminate the weld or a combination of all three so this is something that you need to check before putting your torch together and trying to weld if you see anything that looks like this, do not attempt any welding. Toss these, take them to your tool room, get new ones. Now let's talk about tungsten profile. So we talk about sharpening or grinding your tungsten electrodes. Now for our course, we are going to stick to a 30 degree taper or what some will say a 30 degree grind. We'll take a look at some uh, comparisons on the next slide. But for now, let's just talk about some of the basics. So we know we need to put a taper on our electrodes and then also we're going to slightly blunt the tip. We're not gonna blunt it more than we need to and my rule of thumb or the way that I kind of measure uh, the blunted tip is if you can barely see a glint of light off of the tip reflecting back, then that's good enough. If you see anything more sizable, if we see in, this, in these two examples right here, the tungsten electrode on the left is just, it has too big of a landing on it. Whereas the electrode on the right has just the right amount of blunting or that landing. So you can see here just a little bit of light being reflected back. And this is what I'm talking about by a little glinting. Also, as you're grinding your tungsten, if you hold your tungsten in one spot just too long, you're gonna develop a flat side. So as you're looking all around the tungsten or along the circumference, it should be smooth all the way around. If you see any areas where there is a flat spot, you need to regrind your tungsten because that's going to affect uh, the welding arc. And now here we see those variations in degree preparations that I mentioned earlier. So if we start with a 25 degree taper, we see that the length of the taper is longer and it also results in a much narrower tip. Whereas with a 35 degree, taper is not as long. We see that the tip is a little bit wider. And with a 45 degree, we see that the taper is much shorter and it is much more blunt than a 35 and definitely more than that 25. So for our course, we're using a 30 degree grind. Now, if your instructor says to use anything else, that is going to be dependent on the project and your instructor, but just know in general, we're using a 30 degree grind. Now let's take a look at how our tungsten can become contaminated and what that looks like, and what happens when our electrodes do become unacceptable for use. So in general, kind of like a blanket statement, 
if your tungsten electrode becomes contaminated through any means uh, in any way, shape, or form, do not attempt to continue welding. What you're going to do is you are going to be laying down welds that are probably going to be unacceptable, and that's going to cause for a lot of rework. So as soon as your tungsten becomes contaminated, just stop welding. If you have an extra one on hand that's already sharpened, ready to go, go ahead and swap that out. But if you don't have a spare tungsten electrode, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to remove the contamination. You're going to have to regrind it and then start your weld all over again. What you need to remember here is that any change in shape of the tip of your tungsten electrode is going to result in an abnormal welding arc or this welding arc that is no longer focused. It's going to be wider. It might wander. And that is going to result in an irregular weld or an unacceptable weld. So you need to keep that in mind. Any amount of contamination is bad contamination. Now, just to kind of rewind a little bit, when we talk about removing contamination, I don't mean just grinding the contamination away. You need to completely remove the contaminated portion of your tungsten, either by cutting it off or breaking it off. Do not just stick it into a grinder and hope that you'll remove all of it and start fresh with a uh, ground tungsten electrode. If you're using the pedestal grinders or tungsten grinders that are specifically for tungsten electrodes and you stick a contaminated tungsten in there and use it, you've basically contaminated that entire grinding disc, that diamond disc. So the next person who uses the grinder after you, they're essentially going to contaminate their tungsten and every person after. So remove the contamination completely before you stick your tungsten back into a grinder and resharpen it. Here are some examples of tungsten electrodes that have become contaminated through various methods. Now, these are two different images of the same electrodes. One from right on top, a top view, and then one from kind of a top but also front view. Now, the electrodes that are on the very left and on the very right are tungsten electrodes that are acceptable for use. This is to have some this is to have some kind of comparison with all the electrodes here in the middle that are not acceptable for use. So we can take a look at any of them and see that their shape has changed, whether it's because we've used the wrong polarity, whether we've made contact with the base metal with our tungsten, whether we've um, made contact between our tungsten electrode and the filler rod, whether we're using uh, a too low flow of shielding gas, so not enough shielding gas, whether we're welding with no shielding gas, maybe our amperage is set too high, so you see some discoloration with these tungsten electrodes, so you know that they've been overheated. You've probably got some micro fractures in there, which leads to tungsten spitting. That's not good. So a lot of different things that lead to contamination. Again, contact with the weld, contact with filler rod, using the wrong polarity, um, using the wrong filler rod, using the wrong shielding gas, not having enough shielding gas, too high amperage, so on and so forth. Lots of different things. And the forms or the form that your tungsten will take is not limited to the, uh, the examples you see here. Honestly, there are probably a million different 
shapes and appearances that your tungsten electrode can take on once it's contaminated. So again, for comparison, if it doesn't look like the electrodes on the left or the electrodes on the right, then consider it unusable. And if you continue to try and use a contaminated electrode to weld, this is more than likely what you're gonna get. So we see a couple of different issues going on with these welds. At first glance, an instructor can easily say, you know, in some of these welds, the person welding was doing so without shielding gas, maybe the wrong shielding gas. They were in general using a contaminated tungsten electrode, or maybe their ceramic cup or gas lens had uh, some buildup of contaminants. Maybe they dipped the electrode in a couple of spots um, which is more evident when welding aluminum. So typically when you're welding aluminum, your weld should, ap should appear kind of shiny and metallic like this section right here, but contaminating the weld or contaminating the tungsten in any way is often gonna leave you with these soot marks or these uh, really uh, white, kind of matted white appearances or spots. So here's a nice big area of contamination right here and right here. And another thing that can lead to contamination is simply not cleaning your metal. So in all three cases of this carbon steel here, we see that there's rust on the metal and you don't see any grind or polishing marks. So that's another way that our tungsten can become contaminated. If you're trying to weld over oil, paint, grease, uh, rust, mill scale, anything like that, when you're using GTAW, you need to take that extra time and effort to not only make sure that the parts you're welding with are clean, but you need to make sure that the metal you're welding on is clean as well. And this is what your welds should look like when your parts, uh, when your tungsten, when your metal is free from any potential contaminants. Now there aren't any grind marks on this metal because it's cold rolled. It just has that discoloration from the heat of the weld. This person went over the material with a wire brush before welding. And so you can see that there are no uh, discolored spots in the weld. There's nothing brown. There's no presence of scale, contaminants. Doesn't look like the person dipped their tungsten into the weld or anything like that. And then over here we have a weld on aluminum and same thing. Everything looks nice and shiny in uniform. There are no matte white or very um, bright white looking areas. Now, white and silvery will appear in, in two different ways. So this is kind of silvery. If you see anything white, it's gonna be very apparent. It looks like you've put a little section of printer paper on there. And uh, likewise, with any kind of black soot spots, you see that this weld is free from any of that. And you do see some, uh, some markings from this person using a wire brush so even with aluminum, you need to use a wire brush or you need to clean the surface of your material. If it looks clean, doesn't mean that it is clean. And that's pretty much it. There'll be more to come in future videos, but we're keeping it simple for now. And as always, thank you for watching.